So the make your way around the outside and then the inside. On the inside, there are reliefs that portray um, different facets of you know going to war. There's uh, you know from the bombing offensive over Europe to the home front, um, and interestingly, you know everything is covered. And again, I think it was tr to the the goal was to be really inclusive um, and to try to make sure that everyone's war experience was represented in some way. There are two Easter eggs. There, there's a little um, surprising piece of uh, graffiti, if you look for it, you can find it, that is the one thing that breaks the very somber, you know, classical architecture. You've got reeds, you've got eagles, um, you've got, you know, very somber looking white marble plinths. There's two pieces of graffiti that are hard to find, but that are much more about, are they in the brochure? That's cheating. Um, but they're, they're much more reflective of the, uh, the soldier's experience. Um, and then the other thing to check is, once you've gotten down into the lower level, um, is the, the field of gold stars, which is an interesting, um, kind of borrows a little bit from the Vietnam Wall, but there were uh, about 56,000 deaths in Vietnam. There were more than 400,000 deaths in the Second World War. So it's obviously not possible to put every name on the World War II memo Memorial. And so what they did instead is, you can see it from here, it's, it's sort of directly behind me. Um, there is a, a fountain with uh, a gold star for every 500 deaths. So each star represents 500 people who lost their lives fighting the Second World War. To me, it has a really interesting effect. And when I'm here, I often hang out by the fountain to listen to tourists' response. And one of the ones I hear the most is, is my first response, which is, that's not as many stars as I thought. Like, 400,000 is, a, is a, a, a huge amount of, of loss of life and, and sacrifice, and each, each one represents 500 families who are missing a son or a father or a brother. But for some reason, the number 500 divides it in, and you're like, it, it doesn't seem like as much as I would have thought, which I think is exactly the opposite of the intention they wanted to have. So I don't know exactly how they made that judgment, but you might want to walk down and, and see what response um, you get to that. I, as a historian, I've always thought it's just weird to have it organized by the states. It's very interesting to me now when I come back and visit and I'll watch people interacting with it, especially World War II veterans make a beeline right for their home state. Um, and there will often be World War II veterans standing around acting as interpreters and they'll, they'll be wearing their uniforms and they often will, you know, ask if you'd like to, to hear a little from them. Um, and they go right for their home states too. So on some level, it's worked a lot. Just to me, it, it doesn't, um, it just doesn't resonate because that's one category that didn't organize the war in any way. It would be like, you know, a, a monument that said, this part of the monument is for guys from five foot oh to five foot three, and this part of the monument is from five foot three to five point six. I mean, it just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really say much. The other question to be asking yourself is who is this for? Uh, it was sort of, you know, it was expedited in Congress uh, and the fundraising and the con uh, construction um, with the thought that it was very important to have something memorializing the, the sacrifice of uh, the veterans generation while some of them were still alive. Um, that's not always the, the reason we commemorate things. Uh, you know, memorials go up for different reasons. Um, and the Vietnam Memorial is a really good example because there's a memorial that at first uh, the most vocal opponents were Vietnam veterans themselves who said, we do not want that. That does not represent us. Uh, and in the 1980s, they said, well, it's not just about you. It's about the whole country's experience in Vietnam and the way it affected everyone besides just the people who fought. And you, know, you can think about which parts of this are, are for servicemen and women, which parts are for their families, which parts are for just regular Americans, what part of it is teaching, which is a useful tool that monuments do, and which part is just commemoration or celebration. Uh, but the most interesting way, I think, to look at this is in conjunction with the Vietnam Memorial and the Korean Memorial, which is a another interesting outlier. Um, and those of you who've seen that, it's like a large field of slightly larger than life figures. But the real tone there is realism. Uh, it is not a sort of um, idealized version of the war, which you often see, especially with like Civil War monuments when you're driving around DC. You'll see the guy on horseback and he's got the gleaming gold braid and the horse is rearing back and they look larger than life. The Korean War 
these guys are slogging across a field, they're in their winter gear, and they look tired. You can see the weight hanging in their shoulders, they're humping pieces of gear, uh, some of them have you know, mortar tubes and, and um, machine guns slung across their shoulders, and you can see the fatigue in their faces, you can see the exhaustion in their bodies, and that's a really different kind of portrayal. There isn't that level of realism here. There isn't that level of representation. I don't think they're trying to have that here. So, you know, different, different memorials that are all talking about the same basic thing, which is what, is it, what does this country do when it goes to war, still have really different designs. And you can learn a lot about where the country was at the time the memorial was being designed and built by taking a close look at, at what it looks like and thinking about how it might have looked different.